What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet or you're living in a rock and seeing this YouTube video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. If you're listening to this video or audio on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Pods, welcome in. Make sure you leave us a detailed review. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another episode of the show. I'm your host, Jeff Nader, and we are presented by Barstool Sports. We got a great show planned for you today, as always. And, you know, on this channel, I try to bring you the best in interviews. I've interviewed judges, FBI agents, mobsters, um, correctional uh, officers, really any level of the criminal community. And we talk a lot about the mafia on this show. One of the most interesting parts of the mafia to me is the mafia over the last, let's say, 20 years. It's the last of the Mohicans, if you will. Guys like Vincent Bacciano, John Gotti Jr. Uh, have kind of dominated the end, really, of the mafia in this country. Now, the mob's still around, as we know, but it's definitely fractured. Today, we're going to speak in an exclusive interview to a guy that a lot of you have heard from, but we haven't heard much from him himself. He recently came on to YouTube and is now discussing his life on a new YouTube channel called Mafia Roundtable. It is former Bonanno captain, Dom Chikaley. Dom joins the sit down. Dom, how are you? I'm doing well, Jeff. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Well, I got to tell you, it's good to see you. I've really been enjoying your new YouTube channel. You've kind of come out uh, blaring, ready to go. Uh, and I have to admit, in this interview today, you're looking very uh, Valentine's-esque. Any... Uh, <laughs> What's with what's with the shirt? I don't know. I was in a pinkish mood. So <laughs> real said, men wear pink, as they say. Since everybody's calling me a rat, they might as well call me a rat and a homosexual too. You know, that's <laughs> what the haters like to do. But uh, I'm a man at the end of the day. I'm secure with my manhood, and uh, I chose this color. So I like it. One I actually just colors. I just bought myself a a purple tracksuit, so I'm I'm good with that. I, I I think if you can wear pink and purple, you are very confident who you are, and you. Uh, you know, have, you know, just that ability to do so. Not a lot of people can do it. But, Dom, this is our first time speaking to you. In fact, this is really, the, I think, the first video interview I've seen you do. You you have a couple of videos. We're going to talk about your YouTube channel a little bit later. Um, but I really just want to start at the beginning with you. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, you're part of the, the kind of the last you know, run of the mob, if you will, as far as the big bosses, and the Joey Messinos, the people like that. Your life started, though, in the Bronx, which we really don't hear much about, right? We hear a lot about Queens and Brooklyn and Staten Island. But we really haven't got the perspective of someone from the Bronx. Kind of tell me a little bit about your early life. Um, what what made you interested in, in this life? You know, why did you go that way? Um, great question. I was always looking for love and support from my father, which I, I felt as a child I never had. My father was away in the early 70s. Um, and when he did come home from prison, uh, there was no relationship. He was married to a different woman. He had stepchildren. So his focus was on his new family. And, uh, so I guess I veered towards the streets, maybe being a little rebellious. Um, and then one of his dear friends always supported me, was basically grooming me, and I had no clue of it. Like, I, I wasn't even aware of it. But as I look back, he was grooming me uh, as far as to be strong in the streets. So, the, and to answer your question about the Bronx, the Bronx is a, still to this day a tight-knit area. Um, as I said, I think on my first podcast that, to the best of my recollection, I'm the only cooperator of a high-ranking stature. Um, the, the neighborhood's really a solid neighborhood, and you have a lot of powerhouses there still to this day, uh, excluding uh, Michael Mancuso. Yeah, we're going to talk about him. Uh, he's been in the news a lot recently. Um, feds would allege he's the boss of the family, and he's been up to a lot of crazy hijinks recently. Um a lot of people don't know, you actually got started kind of connected to the Genovese crime family. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, I'm not going to mention the gentleman's name, so I really, uh, and I might wait till after his passing to do any stories, but um, 
that was my father figure. He supported me when my father did it in the streets. You know, there was times that my father came in yelling at me and threatening me. And this man actually uh, stood up and basically told my father, anybody puts their hands on this kid. At the time, I might have been 17, 18 years old. Um, they have to deal with me. So let, let everybody know out there. Nobody touches this kid. And um, that's where, you know, I really gravitated to the streets. I finally felt I was accepted somewhere. Um, and it's a sad situation, too, because in school I loved my sports. I was great at basketball, baseball, pitching. Um, but I just didn't have that guidance and support. Some people could do it without a father figure, but I felt looking back that I needed that. I was one of the individuals that needed that support and somebody behind me pushing me, teaching me, and I didn't have it. So, do you think if do you think if your dad was around, say he wasn't in prison, he wasn't someone that was in the street doing things, do you think if he were around, do you think you would have uh, went into that world? I'm not sure because even with him being out on the street, he was never there for me, even when he was home. Let's so, say he was a regular father. Like he was there, you had dinner every night, he taught you the way in the world. You know, like most, like a lot of fathers do. I, I know there are some that don't, but let's say he were around. You you come across to me as someone who is pretty intelligent. You you've done things after that world that 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 are pretty impressive. You kind of seem to me as if you just had some guidance, which is what you're saying. On the good guidance side, you probably would have not went into that life. Absolutely, I wouldn't have went into the life because I even look at even I'll use Vinny Bashiano for example. His sons, they all at one time emulated Vinny. So I see that a lot when I look at father-son relationships. Even LeBron James, his sons, they're emulating him with the basketball. So, yes, if I had a, a father that was maybe an attorney or a hardworking man, not even an attorney, a hardworking man with uh, hardcore value, not hardcore, but proper values, uh, to give me that guidance where, hey, Dom, you should save some of your money. Dom, look, watch out for the rainy days. Dom, invest your money. Uh, because all this, what I'm saying, I'm doing now. I started in my 40s once I was released from, actually, when I was with Vinny, I was doing that. And then, obviously, now with my change of life, getting out of the mob, I do it even more so. I'm out over 10 years now, and I don't even have a parking ticket. Knock on wood. Um I mean, um, and I had, you'll hear in future podcasts, Jeff, that I've been tempted, had a lot of things go wrong with me, um, a lot. And uh, I just persevered. I kept my head held up high and I just swore I wouldn't go back to that life of violence. I wouldn't hurt anybody. And uh, I would live as a civilian, you know, and the mafia term we used to call people suckers. No, the, the people that are suckers that I look back are the mobsters. They're the suckers. Now, let me ask you something. Um, you obviously um, did do a lot of bad things. I mean, I don't think you'll ever say you didn't. I'm sure you'll talk about them at length at some point. And I want to get into that, but I also want to ask you about your relationship with Vincent Bacciano. He's someone who is, like I said, probably the last, at least up until – you know, several individuals in the groups now, you know, he's kind of that last boss, if you will. Right. You know, he goes away in the mid two thousands. When did you meet him? How, how did that happen? I mean, it, he's obviously someone that's from that area as well. I don't know if he grew up near you, but um, how did you meet Vincent Bastiano? What made you kind of go the way of the bananas as opposed to uh, the Genovese crime family? The only reason why I was released from the Genovese into the Bananos was because the gentleman who I was under in the Genovese crime family felt that Vinny would be a good match for me. He was more settled down. Um, Vinny was more out there. Vinny was known as a big earner. And he felt that we would uh, complement one another out there as far as, you know, we're both similar in a lot of ways. And he was correct at that. The only difference was I chose a different path at the end of the day because I felt I was being used. And like I said, I, I make no excuses. These are just uh, examples of the way I was feeling. 
because at the end of the day, I should have stayed strong, uh, honored my codes, but I didn't. I didn't. I was just tired, and I did take the easy way out of the life, and I'm happy for it because just looking now what that life has become, and as you opened up, you said the mafia is fractured. I think it's more than fractured. It's become a disgrace nowadays. Um, that's why you don't even hear anything with the Genovese crime family. They're so underground, it's not even funny. And I even heard that they won't even see people because of what's going on. They're higher ups, their administration. It's disgusting. So I'm happy with the choices I made. As far as how I met Vinny, when I was in prison, it's, it's a breathing ground where you have all these old time mobsters, the younger mobsters, they see someone like me who's very aggressive, don't take shit from anybody, and will stand my ground. I don't care who you are. And you'll hear on later new podcasts where at one time I told somebody, stop acting like a cop. And this was an underboss in a crime family. And word came back to me from the streets, are you out of your mind? What are you saying? And I explained what they did. They said, all right, you're right, but watch your mouth with people. Uh, because I was taught when people go to jail, their button gets left at the door. And button means all made guys, whether they be soldiers, captains, underbosses, bosses, all those titles get left when you check into a, a prison facility. We're all equals. We all stick together. We all support one another. And me being young, I was always into weights, uh, strong. The older guys love to have me around, especially the pedigree with my family, uh, my uncle, my father, stand up. And um, I, like I said, it was a breathing ground. I had every crime family asking, when you come home, if you want to be with us, we could pull you. You'll be with us. You'll be with us. And I gravitated mostly to Bruno. That goes back with my family before I was born. You're talking um, about Bruno and Delicato. Yes, Anthony and Delicato, correct. Um, till this day, uh, I have nothing but good to say about him. I love the guy. Great, great guy. I'm sorry things had to end this way, but they did. You know, he made his choices in life. I'm making mine. Um, but when I came home from jail, I contacted my Uncle Peter. I said, could you do me a favor, reach out to Bruno? I want to see him. I met up with Bruno. He said, okay. And then next thing I knew, he was introducing me to Vinny Basciano. Bruno recently got out, uh, did a long stretch in prison. Um, I, I guess my, my question on him is, what do you think he would say to you today? Bruno's comical. Bruno's comical. I know he'd be upset, uh, shaking his head. I don't, what I want to say, I'm not going to say because I don't want to tarnish him in any way, shape, or form. But um, I love the guy. Great guy. Stand up. He's a man's man's man. Yeah. And, um, just a great guy. I had a lot of fun with him, a lot of laughs with him. And, you know, if he had to, just like any mob said, they'd put a bullet in the back of my head in a second. Not the, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. And he's true to that life. But if he met up with me in a public place or happened to see me, uh, you know, I'm sure he's not going to make a scene. He's a man. He knows I'm a man. I'm not a punk. And uh, I'm sure we'll have some words. But at the end of the day, uh, I'm not going to answer for him. On the subject of, of Bruno, I, I think one of the real interesting questions we have today that I get posed with all the time and what I do, because, look, I've said before, I'm not a gangster. I just am someone that enjoyed talking about this and looking into it. The question I get posed with is, what are these old guys, people like Bruno, um, you know, s some of these real old cats, you know, the Gene Gottis, if you will, guys like that. Is there a point at, in, in the mob where you just kind of actually do retire? Because, like, it's it, it seems crazy to me that today they're still willing to risk their freedom the, the last couple of years of their their life in in what's going on out there today what do you think those guys do nowadays people like bruno do you want to comment on that uh people like bruno i think he's staying away from the life you don't hear about him i think he's had enough from my opinion this is all my opinion yeah um i think he has had enough with the life he's up in age now and i know he doesn't want to die in jail nobody wants to die in jail uh he'll never rat so he knows the next time he gets put away, it is a death sentence for him. 
And I think he's intelligent enough. He has some people around him, legitimate people, big, big money, where he'll utilize those people, their contacts, some funds, and just live a, by, live a proper life. Stay away from the BS of the mafia because guys like Michael Mancuso, he'll get the whole damn family jammed up. Um, he's just a buffoon. He's right. a buffoon. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, in a recent video I saw uh, by OC Shorts, one of the, the, the better uh, people in our genre as far as what I do, uh, he did a video recently about a, a person called Perry Crisatelli, who I, I know you knew. Um, in the video, he talks about a wiretap where Vincent Basciano essentially says, Perry's an earner. He's never going to do uh, things in the streets for us. He's a guy that's that's an earner for us. Would you consider yourself kind of the opposite? Were you more of the, the you, you mentioned, you you know, you fought, you did what you had to do. You definitely were in the streets doing things. I've always characterized as the great mobsters that we always remember. They're the ones that could do both, earn and hurt people. What would you characterize yourself as? Um, I look at myself that had the, both qualities. I was fortunate enough. What I did was, in my early years, I was a drug dealer. By the time I was 18, I would say I made close to a million dollars. But I had nothing to show for it. I spent it as fast as I made it. And that's why having, if I would have had the guidance there, a father figure, I'm not saying with the illegal funds, but to save, to put money away for a rainy day, for a lawyer. I had no guidance. I was just wild, young, uh, partying as hard as I was making money. And it was just, that's, that's what I was seeing in the neighborhood from kids my own age. But I've made money. Uh, so what I did was when I came home, and people don't know this, but I did 10 years for a crime I didn't commit. That'll, that'll be in a later podcast with myself. Did my time. And while I was sitting away, trust me, it was eating me inside that, you know, I was set up. I was actually set up. I did not do the crime. And I swore I'm not going to be that thug on the street. It's easy to be a thug. It's simple. It takes no brains to pull a trigger. None at all. Or stab somebody or baseball bat somebody. I felt I'm going to use all my skills that I had from the street, from selling firecrackers, cocaine, heroin, crack, everything. Whatever you could think of, I would sell. I'm going to put it to legitimate businesses. So when I came home, I went in the tile marble terrazzo union. I grabbed an old timer after working six months as a helper. Uh, asked him how to read blueprints. He taught me. I, my first job was the Hunts Point Meat Market with my own company. And then from there, I had other friends building homes. I started getting involved with homes. Then you're giving the exclusivities to real real estate offices. I said, no, why am I going to pay them ten, fifteen thousand a house to sell when I could do it myself? I opened up my own real estate office. And from there, a bar lounge, an auto repair shop. And it goes on. It goes on. I was in the process, open up gyms. And you mentioned Perry. I was actually going to do a gym with my acting captain, PJ, Nicholas Piscotti, on Mulberry Street. His aunt had a location. We were going to take over. And being Perry was under in my crew, he was going to help us out, do uh, start a restaurant on Mulberry Street. And who better than him? He had At the time, he had five successful restaurants down there, all powerhouse places. So, of course, he's going to look out for me. I'm his captain. And uh, so I was in the process. I've always enjoyed it. I call it my hustle, my legitimate hustle. So I looked at myself that I had the two qualities. And the best part about it, at the time, before it came out, I was a captain. It, nobody even knew I was made. Again, that'll be another podcast. Vinny got caught on a different wire. Knows the guy's no good and is talking about me being uh, a captain for him, an acting captain. And I just shook my head with that one. But And then at that point, once it hit all the newspapers, then I saw like some of my investors, some people partnering with me, everybody like backing up. But at that time, nobody even knew it. People would come up to me, oh, my God, you're a captain. I didn't even know you were straightened out. I'm like, no, the papers have it wrong. I'm Dominic. I'm the same person. Because I wasn't the type to wear, dress up in suits, hang out on a street corner just to profile. I wasn't the social club type. I didn't like them. I would just go there to service Vinny's social club. 
I'd have a baseball cap on, sweat clothes. I always had a nice car, um, watches, and that was it. I didn't wear any chains. I didn't showboat. Now, don't get me wrong. If I'd go out, it would always be in Manhattan or in neighborhoods that don't know me. And I would dress up. More than likely, I would have a car. So we had a car service around us. And uh, when I, especially when I knew I was going out drinking, we'd have a car. And I'd go out, and then, you know, I could showboat a little bit because people don't know me. But my neighborhood, I always kept it even keel. Nobody even had a clue. So not to, in any disrespect, you, you wanted to kind of be in those yuppie circles, if you will. You, you didn't want to be around the, 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 the gangsters with the tracks. You, you just wanted to go make your money, move around a little bit, and that was it. You weren't kind of a buffoon, if you will, out in the streets. Um, I wasn't a buffoon. I wouldn't call myself a buffoon. So other people might say differently. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Um, and I did love staying with gangsters, but not gangsters that have to puff their chest out. There's a lot of people out there. As soon as they get made, their chest goes out. They think they're Superman. And I wasn't one of them. To me, um, I didn't even want it. I didn't even want it. I didn't need it. I was groomed by another guy in prison. Uh, he was an old timer from Harlem, heroin dealer. And he even told me, sat me down. He went back many years with my family, my uncle. He was like, Dom, you don't need that life. You're a man. As long as you stand up for yourself, it doesn't matter. You could go up against any wise guy. If they disrespect your manhood, you stick up for yourself because you'll always have your day in court where you sit down. And when you sit down, you bring it back to the boss or the captain who's ever sitting there and ask them, how would they react? If somebody called you a punk, a snitch, said something that wasn't true, would you accept it? I'm a man. And if I did accept it, that means it would be true. By me not accepting it, it shows I'm not any of the above. And furthermore, all due respect, he's a made guy. Am I correct? And they'll say, yeah, they'll nod and or they'll just say and. Well, if he is, don't you guys take a code that you're supposed to be above us? By him making false accusations and saying things? Come on. You're supposed to be carrying yourself in a better standard, and you're not. So, I, I, again, I'll win that all day long in a sit-down. But um, so to get at your point, I didn't need the title. I didn't need any title because I did what I had to do. You'll hear more stories. Uh, even when I came home from jail, there was a lot of jealousy. I've robbed people in my younger days. And then they throw a label on me, Dominic's a rat, for no reason. Because I had a murder case that was reduced down to manslaughter in the state. But I even know the facts. Pull the records. All you have to do is pull the records. Never ratted. Vinny's first question at trial. First question. Did you ever work with any type of law enforcement whatsoever? Did you ever give any information? My answer was absolutely not. No. Pull the records. So before somebody throws daggers, makes statements, they should always check and verify facts. You know, that's why I say I don't know everything. If I don't know something, like I said with Bruno, I can't speak for him. Right. And I didn't want to say how I feel because he might not feel that way. And it's wrong if I put out a statement. That's a lesson to all of you YouTubers out there. Make sure you have facts. Make sure you have paperwork. That's important nowadays. Um, you wrote a short book uh, with Ed Scarpo, kind of a bit of more of an anthology about the Bananos. You told some stories. Um, and you talked at one point in that book about um, around the time you were made, Vincent Bacciano essentially said to you, you know, how do you feel, you know, uh, you know, and you kind of discussed and you kind of made that clear in what you just said. That really didn't mean much to you, right? I mean, you hear some of these folks. It's like, this is a huge day. I'm getting made or whatever. We've seen it in Goodfellas. You know, Tommy wants to be made. That's all he right. wanted. Didn't you? You didn't really want that. You just wanted to kind of be connected, make a lot of money and, and, and be out of the limelight, right? Yes. And I'm glad you read the book because I really forgot about it. You know, you forget throughout the years. So even in some of my podcasts. I'll speak and then I'll reference, I'll apologize and I'll tell them I'm not cutting anything. I'm keeping it real because I'm entitled to make a mistake or make an error, especially when you're reflecting close to 20 years ago. Yeah. Or something. But yes, you're right. Um, 
Vinny and I actually went back and forth with that. Like, Dom, you have, what do you mean you're not going to, you don't want it? I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't need it. I'm a man. I have you. Well, I'm not always here. I, then I don't need it. I don't need you. Like, I don't need it. I was just adamant about it. But he needed me. So he, he, so he proposed you to, to be made because, you know, you, as you said, you didn't really want it, but he did it in the case of if he weren't around, you were kind of next in line. Well, he knew he was even on tape with Joe Messino state and Dominic, this Dominic, that he also suggested, Joe, if you have a dime, a penny coming, you'll get every single cent with Dominic, you know, which, you know, it's sad. It, at the end of the day, it's sad because I really um, got screwed over every which way over Sunday. But that's neither here or there. I'm here today. They're not. They're uh, locked up. Joe, who who knows where he's at. But he's probably, probably having some uh, mimosas with Sal Vitale right now. Well, I know that for a fact to not be true. Uh, I, I've spoken to some people. Uh, they have not spoken, from what I understand. Oh, okay. they, they won't. Okay. Uh from what I know, Joe Messino lives in Florida all, all alone from what, what I've heard. But I want to ask you about Joey Messino because I've gotten stuff from other YouTubers, and I don't know if they listen or, or really understand where I'm coming from. But I'll ask you, I've called Joe Messino as a boss, one of the greatest bosses in the history of the mafia. And I think his pedigree and ability spoke for itself. He took the family really through a lot of hard and tough waters. He took them to be one of the strongest families. In fact, the Genovese family said that at one point. Alan Longo mentioned it on Wiretap at one point and said, the two strongest families are this family, they mean the Genovese, and Joe's family, which is the Bonanos. He did a lot of things that were revolutionary. He didn't want social clubs. He didn't want people talking. He wanted the sons who the families wouldn't flip. Talk to me about Joey Messino. Uh, do you agree with that sentiment? Uh, Joe was a chameleon. So um, what he did, he made a power move. I think if he never kills those t the three captains that evening, uh, we're a different family. I don't think Joe put a, lo a lot of weak people in high positions, in my opinion, who didn't even deserve to be in the life. Like who? Um, his whole administration, from his brother-in-law down to Richie Cantarelli, shellacked to even Perry being made. Perry's a great guy. Love Perry. Sweetheart. Great personality. He doesn't need the life. He didn't need that. He was an earner. But he was a legitimate guy. Why are you going to take him? He was around Richie. Why are you promote? Why are you making him your equal? For what reason? Right. And everybody has a reason. And Joe always said this. And I've never met Joe in person. It just didn't happen. But I've heard a lot about him. He knew a lot about me um, out there. Joe always said, from what I was told, it takes a lot of ingredients to make a soup. And he's right. He's very smart. And, yes, he did take this family to another level both ways. He elevated it to one of the top families, and he destroyed it as well with all the people he put into power that everybody flipped. And that's a great point you make because ultimately when Joey Messino gets arrested, really up until that point, no one had cooperated. That was the thing about the bananas. No one had really testified. No, no one had uh, defections. It was up until 2002. There was never a made yeah. member that cooperated in the banana plant. And, and we've taken, I think it was Frankie Copa was the first one. I yeah, think. I'm not sure. Uh, you would be correct. And he also mentioned his, his brother-in-law, Salvatore Vitale, who is probably, at least to me, I think he's the most uh, probably destructive mafia witness of all time. I mean, he put so many high-ranking people away uh, and gave them long sentences. That's a really interesting point that you don't think about. Um, I want to talk quickly a little about Vinny. Uh, you know, he's obviously a guy that when you described kind of how you took your money that was illegal, right? Drug money, things like that. You put it into legitimate business. We would learn about Vincent Basciano. He did a lot of the same things. Um, everything from, you know, he was very connected to uh, Tony Cole, who just happens to turn up dead, takes his bookmaking operation. He then buys salons and all these different things. And he was also very in construction. What kind of guy was he kind of uh, day to day? You were around him a lot, probably more than anybody. Really? 
Billy was a fair person, very charismatic, fun to be with. Um, definitely 1,000% gangster. Um, he just had a personality, very likable. If you were dead wrong with something, Vinny would always hit you with an analogy. And at the end of the day, you'd be looking at, like, if you know that sky is blue, after hearing Vinny's analogies, his four or five analogies, you believe that sky is orange. Like, he, he was just that, he was, he was hilarious. He was really a funny guy. Good to be around, always had your back. Um, I have nothing bad to say. The only issues were, and he hates the stigma, gorgeous. Could not stand it. That was put on him uh, because of the beauty salon he had opened. Hello, gorgeous. Can't stand it. He would tell everybody, call me Vinny B. Vinny B. And you you also said in that book that no one ever called him that to his face, right? Is that kind of a norm? You know, we hear about these mob nicknames all the time, right? You know, we hear, you know, I've heard um, Stephen Crea. Uh, nobody right. calls him Wonder Boy. That was a name that uh, the, the media put on him. These names, I mean, a lot of the time, they're not actually used in, in real life. Um, you know, no one called John Gotti the Dapper Don, you know, in real life. Um, you mentioned no one ever called him Vinnie Gorgeous, right? People that didn't know him might slip, hey, Vinnie Gorgeous, just yeah. to say it. But uh, he would correct them really quick. Not in a nice way. It wasn't disrespectful. Vinnie wasn't, and I have to, I hate to use it, like a Michael nose has to puff his chest out. Vinny was secure with himself every which way, and he was humble. He was a humble guy. But you cross him, you'll see a different side of him. Um, but he would correct them with that, you know, do me a favor, call me Vinny B. You're going to call me. I'm, I'm curious of what, um, when, when Joe Messino flipped, where were you that day? What did you hear? Yeah. What were your kind of I floor was getting kicked down that day when Joe when it came out Joe Messino flip. So you and knew the writing was on the wall, probably. Of course. They had me under the SAMS Act. I'm pretty sure it's called the SAMS Act. It's a terrorist act where they lock you up. Zero communication. Mm -hmm. Full lockdown. No phone communication. Nothing. Zero. People had to send me was sending me lawyers. I was locked down like that, I think, for three to four months until Judge Garifus lifted the order on me. Um, and that was because of the uh, the supposed hit on the prosecutor. Not supposed, the hit on the prosecutor. Um, they just wanted to make sure for the safety of the government. And I don't blame them. When, when I look back, I, at that time I was fuming. But when you look back, of course, they have to protect their own. And they'll do anything. And they should do anything to protect their own. And you're talking about, uh, at one point, Bastiano uh, has an idea to kill Greg Andrews, a prosecutor for the federal government. Let me ask you, do you think he actually would have did that? Well, just to correct that, and yeah. you'll know at a later time it wasn't Bashiano that concocted that. So Interesting. Wasn't him. Do you think, though? So, yes, him and I. And I, I told the government that, too, when I sat down with him. Of course, we're going to act because our lives are on the line. You have to do, you know, an organized crime, you have to move forward. But I, I guess my, my question to you would be, and I, I relate it to, um, I don't know if you've ever seen The Wire, but in The Wire, there's a character and he attempts at one point, he wants to kill a state senator. And one of the other characters says to him, you know, this isn't killing someone in the street. This is killing, you know, you kill someone like that, the whole weight of the government's going to come down on you. Exactly. And Joe Messino, I always thought, made a, an interesting point in saying, like, what what do you have to gain by doing that? Did you ever at one point think like we can't just get some random guy to do this? This is um, this is a different type of thing we're we're, we're considering doing here. No, we were going to handle it in house. Uh, myself and uh, Vinny, we were going to go in. You know, we had everything set up, but um, thank God it didn't happen because you know, to me, Greg Andre is great man doing his job. That's all it is. It's his job. Now. A prosecutor, somebody crosses the lines, they get involved in our stuff in the street. And it's a different story. You know, the guy's part of the life. And thank God I've always say, said this, even to my wife, um, who's a hardworking woman. And she, I told her from day one when she met me, I told her my real name because I didn't want her falling in love with me. And then I spring it on her who I am. 
So I told her from day one so she could think with her mind. She says, no, everybody's entitled to a second chance. And with that, this is the longest I've ever been married, been with a woman, and it's 10 years now. And I, um, where was I going with this? To get back. Uh, Andrews. Oh, excuse, oh, with Greg Andres. Everybody, and I explained this to her, don't you feel bad? I said, absolutely, I feel bad for my victims, their families, and I apologize in court. Until this day, I still apologize. I feel for their families. But all the victims in my life, in my past, were in the life. These are the same people. They would have put a bullet in the back of my head in a second. So there was no innocent victims. There was no civilians that I have ever hurt. These are people, street people, just like myself. And but Dom, I think people will, will, will say to you, well, hold on a second, you know. Pizzola wasn't in the life, really, was he? I mean he wasn't in the life. Okay. He was in the wasn't he what from what we understand, wasn't he more of like a construction guy? Tell us more about it, I guess. Okay. I, um from my understanding, and I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I know things happened. Him mm -hmm. stabbing somebody in the hand in the restaurant. Another okay. guy was shot in the foot. Randy, you know, he's I think um, was passing some comments. He's the only killer in the banana front. He was a rough and tumble guy too, as well. So he you're was. you're essentially saying, you know, they would have did the same thing to me, and that's Absolutely. why I did what I did. Absolutely, it's fair. Absolutely. That's fair. And I think that's the growing thought with the mafia in general. A lot of the time, and I know there are several cases with people like Casso and guys like that, that they did kill citizens. But um, the truth is, most of the people that you're saying you were involved with, with, with taking out uh, were a part of that world and they would have did the same thing to you. Um, Dom, this is probably not the last time we'll talk. You and I can't stay on a show for three, four hours and go through every single part of your life. And I'm sure you're going to do that. So if, if there are people that don't get their questions answered, I'm sure you'll answer them at some point, but I do want to ask you kind of two questions and I want to get some listener questions and then show you some photos and kind of get your thoughts on some people. You mentioned Michael Mancuso. You've done it on your show. You've done it here uh, several times. It's clear there's no love lost between you and Michael. Um, Michael is someone that was with Vincent as well. Um, he has a long line of connection to the mafia. Um, I, I guess you can tell the disdain in your voice for him. What What is that? Is that a something you just, you didn't like it from the beginning? You weren't a fan of him from the beginning? Where did that start? When I first came home from prison uh, the second time, and I met Vinny, I was in the neighborhood. And I had the ability, I made money. Legitimately. Legitimately. I would throw things at Vinny, let's do this. No, let's do that. No, let's do legitimate businesses. Finally, after about the 80th thing I asked him, he said, yes. I took off with everything I was doing from construction to real estate. Um, so immediately I went out. I picked up a Highline Mercedes, driving in the neighborhood, doing well. I had a few vehicles. All of a sudden, somebody comes up to me and, hey, Dom, we're talking, an old friend of mine. Actually, he was my partner in the drug business back in the day. Tells me, um, wow, beautiful car. You're doing well. I said, I'm back on my feet. I'm doing okay. Well, word is you're selling heroin. And I know it came from Michael because Michael was going with Joey Relay's ex and her. Joey, Re I'm a, a name Sharice. He was going with Sharice. My sister Selena was going with the other guy. So I know where it came from. Right away I knew it because the guy, Michael, who told me, I'm going to just keep it at first names, he didn't go out. He never went out. You know, from the drug business, he never got arrested. He got out of the business. And he had a small construction company. He was doing okay for himself. So I know where it came from. So I, so I started with, do me a favor, whoever said that, tell them they could blow me. Like I started talking really nasty, greasy, greasy, because I knew who it was. And if they don't like what I say, my, uh, the other kid, his name is Michael, too. I'm sorry. I said, Michael, tell them to come. I'll meet them anywhere they want. I don't care if they're a maid guy, if they're a captain, if they're going to put a fucking label on me that looking to get me locked up because I was on probation, supervised release. 
word gets out, especially a supervised release officer, he sees three or four vehicles, the way I'm living, I don't need that over my head, especially when I wasn't doing that. So I know it came from him. My father used, back in the day, used to date Michael's sister. And my father said, Dom, I always had problems with the guy. He was always a wannabe. He used to stay around the Purple Gang. And he was basically their coffee boy, their errand boy. He did nothing, Michael. Um, he, he was there for a few pieces of work with Vinny. And the government's well aware. I don't know which ones because I wasn't told specifics. Oh, he did 15 years for one of them. Well, that was yeah. one of my cases. But um, with that, he's a stand I'm not saying, you know, there's a label on now. He's a rat because he wrote a letter from what I heard. But I think he's also a stand-up as they come. I don't think he would ever tell. But I, did, I thought I would never tell. So, I, you know, I'm sorry. That's an ignorant, ignorant statement on my part. Uh, because, like I said, I thought I would never tell. But um, I just, I didn't like him. I didn't like the way he carried himself. And then um, another thing, too, the man that killed his father walks around in our neighborhood. And Michael says hello. At the time, I saw Michael say hello to him on a few different occasions. It's like, are you joking? This is a guy who you know killed your father. And what's even more disgraceful there was other made members with Michael's father from a different crime family, and they never reacted or did anything. So, you know, it just you put that in the back of the head and just seeing his actions, him sleeping with Joey Relay's wife at the time. The guy goes away to jail. He's doing his time. He's a friend. He's a made guy. And you go with his wife. There's a thousand women out there. Right. Like that you don't do. And um, I just well, I never liked him from that point on. Well, it's becoming clear possibly why. I mean, we, we've heard a lot about him over the last year, and he, he's behaving all over the place. I mean, you go to somebody's funeral. Yeah. I read in the paper, you go to somebody's funeral. Come on. All right, the guy's shelf. He's shelf. You're going to tell me, and he's mad. I think it's his wife's father. His father-in-law, right. Right, his father-in-law. You're going to tell him he can't go to his father-in-law's funeral? Come on. Also, what, what makes, I think, it all kind of a wild story is, the individual you're talking about, Joe Camerano, was a guy who a lot of people respect, from what I understand. Very high up guy. People yes. respect what he's done. His father was in that world. I love Joe. Joe is a great man. I love Joe. The father was had some laughs with him when I used to be in their presence with administration meetings uh, when Messina was away. Love him. I would just sit there and learn, absorb everything from the old timers. Yeah, I guess, you know, Mancuso wasn't happy with the fact that he was trying to kind of consolidate and, and, and pull people on the power in the family. And he shelves him again. If he's shelved, why do you care what he does and whose funeral he goes to? It really exactly. shouldn't matter. Um, so you're saying that I think ultimately you kind of believe that Do you think he's going to do something that's going to ruin that family more than it already has been. Uh, I don't even know if people respect him. Uh, you know, I, I just, I don't see it. I, I don't see it. The family was just devastated. I know. And I've always said this when I cooperated and then we said, Mike, we knew Michael was an acting boss. I said, Vinny's the new boss of that family. And until this day, I still believe it. Um, Vinny might not have the title of official boss, but Michael got in that position as, a fit, as noted by the papers and everybody else as official boss with Vinny's backing. Without Vinny's backing, Michael never gets that. So are you, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, I'm just asking you. So are you essentially saying that you believe he's still pulling the strings? I'm not saying he's pulling strings anymore because they have him, I'm sure they have him highly monitored where he's at. I mean, but, he's not at ADX anymore. Which, which no, is, I know. But still, he's, um, I don't, he's not pulling any strings. But at the time, I'm sure he sent word out back in the day, make sure. You know, he had the – Michael just didn't get that spot because sure he was a nice guy or he was feared or he was well-respected. A lot of people out there don't like Mike. Michael's in way over his head, put it that way. That's what and I hear. That's it That's it in a nutshell. Last question, and then I'll, we'll have some fun here. Um, You obviously – I'm sure people will watch this and say, well, how's this guy on the street? You obviously cooperated. You've said that. Um, 
at what point did you decide you were going to do that? Because you said at one point you you thought that would be something you would never do. And we always hear that, you know, I'm sure no one ever thought Joe Messina would cooperate. I'm sure we, no. you know, I'm sure there was a time whether he wants to admit it or not. John Gotti Jr. never probably thought he'd sit down with the government and tell them things. Um, right. wh wh when did you decide to do that? And, and you're really just saying you did it because they were kind of backdooring you in, in a way, right? Everything that was going on with me from taking away my support level. Okay, I have a, a crew out there, guys. I'm a captain. I have an acting captain. I'm arrested. My acting captain's still there. He's supposed to be running my crew, taking care of my crew, servicing them. And this, that's my support. So if I need help, if I need financial support, my construction project finished, I go to my members. Michael dismantled everything on me. They even told Vinny, what's going on? Like, why is it being, I'm not, I didn't receive life, wasn't even found guilty yet. He did this all within, I would say, the first week that I was locked up. Um, from there, and I'll just give you one, one statement. The Christmas before I got locked up, I collected about $360,000 in Christmas contributions, let's say. I had concrete companies, plumbers, just all giving me envelopes because throughout the year, if my plumber would come to me, Dom, uh, I'm not getting paid on this job. All right, let me see what I could do. Make sure he gets paid. You know, I would make sure he got his money. Concrete company, Dom, I have somebody who owes me 35000 Let me see what I could do. All of a sudden, Dom, thank you. They're on a payment plan. They're giving me 5000 a month. Okay, no problem. So at Christmas time, everybody shows their appreciation. I took all that money. I was with Louis DeChico. Gave it all to Joe Messino. Vinny Basciano, that Louis said, are you crazy? Why are you giving them everything? I said, because they're in jail. This is Vinny's first Christmas away. Let their families have a good time. Let them, you know, show. I'll make it up through the year, throughout the year. You know, I'll just take a little extra on my part. So he says, all right, good move, smart move. Then all of a sudden, I'm, I get popped in January. I'm sitting in jail, going through. I mean, they took everything from me little by little started losing things when i came out of the hole my mother's contacting me dom i have to claim bankruptcy no she didn't say that she says dom what do i do they're calling so i had a lot of rental properties i'm not going to say who but they kept all the rent money you're talking out of the four months maybe two hundred thousand dollars in rents i said Ma, just claim bankruptcy don't worry about it when that next christmas came around they sent my girl $3,500. I turned around and I said, you know what? I'm done. And this was weeks before Vinny's first trial. Weeks. I called my attorney, tell them I'm done. Walk me in. And that was it. I was done. The hardest thing, that was the hardest decision I ever had to make in my life. And it broke my heart when I left. So I was with Quiet Dom. We were together that whole year. And Quiet Dom the acting boss of the Genovese crime family. And it broke my heart when I had to leave him because he even said, Dom, it's a fucking disgrace what they're doing to you on the street. And he knows he's from our neighbor. He's from the Bronx. So with that, I just, it was time for me to change, turn my ways around and, uh, and hope I could make a better life for myself. I could acclimate myself, my ways. But usually when I do something, it's 110%. That's why I excelled so um, so well in the mob. I advanced so quickly because I gave it 110%. I was there 24-7. I mean, Vinny and I would have walk talks at 3 in the morning. We'd come to my house in the rain. We'd get out and walk when serious things happened that had to be done. Uh, whatever needed to be done, I was on call all the time so. so you feel you felt like you gave your all to that life and it didn't give much back that and everything i do in life i always give my all i'm 110 percent with everything do you um, think um do you think if let's say they they did take care of you your mom your girl think you would have did what you did absolutely not absolutely wow. not
And I'm not using that as an excuse. So you would have you would have went to you would have went to prison for life. You were a with that. I would like I told Vinny, help me, let me liquidate. Because when the government got me, number one, I just gave Vinny and Joe three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. All my cash was in my construction projects. Vinny, do me a favor. Vinny owed me personally a million dollars. Do me a favor. Make sure all my projects get completed. I was about 90% completed on them. Make sure they get completed. We'll flip them out. And then I'm liquid maybe about $10 million. I'm going to throw $2 million into our legal fees. If I get life, fuck it. I get life. I'm sitting on $8 million. My two children are taken care of. And I can live like a king the rest of my life. I don't want to be doing life in jail. With nothing. With nothing, especially when this was mine. Now, don't get me wrong. If I And for the record, if I never had anything that they didn't take anything away, it wasn't the money. I would have stayed in jail. I would have did my life broke. So I never had it. But when you're taking from me and I'm in jail for the crime family, where's the loyalty? Right. No, loyalty, I, it, works, loyalty works both ways, Jeff. I think it makes total sense, man. I, I, I've always, you know, and I, I haven't always had the whole, you know, I, you know the rat thing. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's something I would do, but again, I'm not in that position, so I can't really talk about it. But when you talk about it the way you are, it, it definitely paints the picture of they didn't give a fuck about you. So why should you give the fuck and about listen, them? I know we have to move on. One more thing. Yeah. Jeffrey Littman was my attorney. He represented El Chapo and yep. John Gotti Jr. So yeah. powerful attorney. Oh, yeah. Vinny's selling a house. I have a piece of the house. He's supposed to give me 100000 Now I'm all I can give you is 50. I have legal bills. Okay, I understand that. Do me a favor. Send the 50 to Jeffrey because I have to get him paid. Weeks go by because they had us separate. When we have our next meeting, I asked Jeffrey, did you get the money? Jeffrey's like, no, Vinny didn't send me anything. I asked Vinny, what happened? Well, my son had an altercation in the street, had a fight. I had to give the 50000 to his lawyer. I'm looking at the death penalty because of this family. And what happened to our oath when we take the oath? The mafia family comes first, comes right. before our, intern, our, our biological family. Right. So, so what, what is it, Vinny? So we don't come first? This is my money. I'm looking at the death penalty because of this family. And you're worried about an assault charge for your son? So the 50000 went there. That's when I said, you know what, I have I, it just compiled. It was, and there's so much more, and I'm going to be doing a, a good podcast with that one, and, and it's powerful because and there's I'm, stuff that went on. I'm looking forward to your next show. You, you're doing a lot of good stuff, and I'm going to ask Thank you me. about it. The, the last, I, I think, kind of the last, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this. So just remember, Dom, I'm, if you don't want to answer, I get it. I'm just doing what I do. Okay, yeah. Jerry Capisci, mm -hmm. you know who he is, right? Yes, I do. Jerry wrote a story back in 2015 claiming you attempted to extort Vincent's family. Okay. You want to comment on that at all? Absolutely not. Not true. I now mention a guy who used to actually we used his license for the I mentioned I had a real estate office. Mm -hmm. We used his license, called me up, said, I said, How'd you get my number? Well, your cousin gave me the number. Okay. There's a house, your houses in the a different part of the Bronx, not in our neighborhood, by Gun Hill Road, if people are familiar with that area. We had two houses over there as well, two two family homes. They were in foreclosure. You know, you could get them back. Here's what you have to do. Uh, just do this. I'm like, no, 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 that's okay. If if it's legit, call my lawyer, work it out for my lawyer. To the best of my recollection, that was the conversation. And that was it with the guy, Allen. But I spoke with him. All those other allegations, not true. Not true. That's just, um, you know, and when he did call me, my antennas went up. Like, why would you call? Why would you be concerned about something that's maybe 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, telling me foreclosures? Well, no, you could get the foreclosure. Like, he just came up with a story. It was believable. But I didn't bite. I didn't bite. And then if there was, a, you know, if they had, I even thought, am I being recorded? I don't know what it, you know, whatever it was, it was. But that's totally false. I'm going to be stupid enough to go extort Vinny's family. 
Come on. Right. I'm sure that wouldn't come up. I'm sure you. I'm sure they would have uh, contacted you about it if it happened. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions from the uh, listener base. Uh, someone asked, "Who are the guys you were closest to in other families?" Can you disclose that? Yes. Um, Mickey Boy Paradiso with the game. Really? Oh yeah, I love Mickey. We built up a relationship in jail, and then when we came home, uh, we had a good relationship. Uh, I've heard he's a he's a he's pretty nice guy but he's got a dark side as well sweetheart there's a lot of stories with mickey boy and i also have a ton a ton of jail stories which are just hilarious and that's in jail you see people's true colors sure a lot of true colors uh i was close with him uh who else i got along very well with andrew campos who's also a gambino big earner bronx guy yes uh, I'm not sure. Bronx, Westchester. Yeah, we went to Mount Vernon. He's close with John Diddy Combs. Yes, that's a that's uh, a that's a really interesting connection. Uh, they played on the same football team. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Andrew's a great guy. You know, we had some laughs. Um, and the listener, I know you don't know this, but uh, the Penthouse Club, which was owned by a Jewish group, I'm very close with, and I used to go there protected that club, didn't take an envelope, not one single cent from them. I just told them, when I come in there, if I want to wear a baseball cap, I could wear a baseball cap. Because over there, you have to suit up, be you know dressed up in the place. And you see that VIP table? I want that table. I don't care who's sitting there. They said, okay. And I pay all my bills. And that's the way I left it. When I came home from jail, they didn't know what they had to do for me. And it helped get me back on my feet. Because it shows. I never took advantage of innocent people, people making a living. Now, don't get me wrong. If somebody was loan sharking, a sports book, yeah, I'm going to put pressure on them. They have to kick up money. Legitimate businesses, businessmen, no. If I could help you out, I'll help you out. And I'll carry my own weight. I'm not one of these guys to sit back and take advantage, run up twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 liquor tabs, and then walk out. No, I paid my own bill. There's a question that talks about if you were paid by the government, can you disclose that? Paid by the government when? When to my, family, when my family, after I was cooperating? Yes. Yeah. When uh, I was relocated, my family was, yes. They were giving them assistance, helping them out. Um, but I think the, the thought of, and this is something I think that that's probably not true, and I'm sure you'll you'll tell us it's not true. I think the thought is they give you tons of money, right? No. They give all, you know, it's, it's like. That's not really what they do, right? Absolutely not. When I got out, I no, no, they don't give you a ton of money. They, you know what? They make sure that they help your family get back on their feet. Not not back on their feet, but they're living. They have a place, uh, a roof over their head, food on the table, and then you have to look for jobs. You know, to work. They mm -hmm. only do it for so long until you go into the witness protection program, and then over there, it's. It's full blown. That's where they have all the resources, where they really help you out. There's another one. Uh, can you ask Dom what type of money he was making as a capo and where were Vincent Bacchetto's number spots and how lucrative were those businesses? Uh, also, was he involved with Vinny's drug business? Uh, Vinny was out of the drug business after the Blue Thunder case. Oh, yep. no, let me correct that. When I met Vinny, they were getting stuff from Canada, him and Bruno. And I'll mm -hmm. go into that at a later date. They were bringing in drugs. Towards the end of it, we weren't touching any drugs whatsoever. Uh, and that's when Vinny started rising up in the ranks. But as far as money, you were making most of it through legitimate business. But the, some of the poker, video poker, what, what kind of money does that earn? Because people don't realize that's a very lucrative business. Oh, yes. Vinny's po Vinny had one of the biggest joker poker routes in the Bronx and number locations. I would say... Now, mind you, this is I'm going back a long time, so I might be inaccurate. So I'm going to give you just a ballpark, no, a big ballpark. And I would say it was anywhere from maybe forty to maybe eighty thousand dollars a month. Wow. Um, you know, and that's just one right? Because some months you're going to get hit with the numbers, but he had really a, a massive, massive business. He really did. Um, Let me ask you, um, just on that. Thread, and I could be uh, wrong with that ballpark because I'm looking, you know, it's it's a while. And that question came out of the blue. 
So. Yeah. I, one quick question. Uh, in I think it was 2018, 2019, there was an individual in the Bronx, Sally Dazatola, killed. A lot of people wonder who it was. Essentially, it was proven that his son had him killed. Did you ever meet him? Uh, I know he was very involved with that business. He I knew- love Sally. I love Sally. Great, great guy. Even his family. Till this day, I'm shocked. Put it this way. All fingers point to the son with tapes, with uh, not tapes, text messages. Yeah. I still don't believe it. That's how close that family was. Great people. Um, you'll hear stories with that. I'll be doing podcasts. We were there every single Sunday at Sally Daz's house. My daughter was one years old in my arms. And there would be 40, 50 people in the backyard. The family, great, wonderful family. And it's a tragic tragedy. Tragedy till this day. I can't believe it. Just he was, knowing. He was a tough old guy from what I what I read. Not only uh, tough, but give you the help everybody in the neighborhood. The son, too. The both sons. Everybody. They help everybody in the neighborhood. They weren't money-hungry kids. I mean, they drive around a basic Cadillac, an Acura, like, they, they could have had Miss Rolls Royces, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, and they didn't. I'm just, I'm shocked. It hurts me till this day knowing how this man died. And I can imagine the torment and anguish the rest of the family members have that all, all fingers pointed to their brother, Anthony. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy yeah, story, it's man. Sad. It's sad. Yeah, it really is. And I not believe, I know if myself or Vinny were out there, None of this would have ever happened. None of this. Or if Michael did his job as the boss of the Bonanno crime family, none of this would have happened. Instead right. of worrying about smiling, showing his new teeth on Instagram that I heard, you know, he's a, he's a disgrace. He's a disgrace. I won't even get started, so I'll get heated up real quick with that. Yeah, we, we definitely can see what no. he meant to me and his family. Yeah. It no, just shows no. how much of a punk Michael is. Right. He probably should have dealt with it. Maybe. He definitely, all day long, he should have dealt with that. I want to show you a couple of photos uh, of people you had run-ins with. Just kind of tell me the first thought you have about these people. Um, TG, did you ever meet him? Uh, no, I never met him. I met his daughter. He was away. Um, that's another hilarious story when I met Renee in uh, Rayo's. But no, I never met him. I heard a lot about him. I heard, you know, he was just a knock around guy, always comical, fun. You told, um, and I'm hoping you'll tell us quickly the story, just in a roundabout way. Uh, and I think you know where I'm going with this. No, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm smiling because you're smiling. <laughs> no, no. Because I, I have to admit, uh, Dom, this to me is one of the most classic stories I've ever heard about the mafia. And I can almost see it. Uh, tell me a little bit about this guy. Oh. <laughs> Tony Green. I love him. I love him. Funny, funny, funny. Wow, look at that hair. <laughs> oh, I love him. Great guy. I hope he stays away from everybody. He just got out recently. I know. Man's man. Uh, great. I have more funny stories with him, Tony. Hilarious, especially when I first saw him. I'm not even going to go in. I can't go into it. Can you, can you just, like, Cliff Notes, tell us a story about when you and Vinny are waiting for him. And he gets out of the Hummer. Yeah, okay, just uh, briefly, he comes out of. Tony was a workout buff. Tony always young. He's about eighty now. I don't know what he looks like now. But in those pitches, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. He's about seventy. No, I think he's eighty-five. No, but in that picture you just. Flashed. Oh yeah, I think that's yeah. That was probably 15, 20 years. Always ago. stand up, white, funny guy, smart. Um, he came out of his car and. I'm like, I'm looking. I look at Benny. Benny looks at me. I'm like, Benny, no. Don't. Whoa. What the fuck is he wearing? And he has gym tights on, like the tight spandex that the guy, the bodybuilders wear. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. He's the acting boss. Oh, we're fucked. And Benny and I, listen, there's more to the story. I don't want to give it away, but. Great guy. I came out of the car. I said, Vinny, don't do it to me. Because Vinny said, at the time, I wasn't straightened out. Vinny's like, come on, come meet him. Vinny, no. Dom, get out of the car. I'm not getting out of the car. <laughs> so as we're walking, I told you. Vinny's talking on the back. I told you, look, look, look. 
Look at his balls. Look at his balls. Like, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the spandex he's wearing. Yeah. Like, let me fuck you. Fuck, like, we're, we're just talking. And we're walking. We're maybe about a football yard away. And as we're getting closer, it was just – it was hilarious. But a great guy. Great, great guy. You know, I don't know. I know the Sopranos, right? Is is a lot of the characters are based loosely parts of them on certain people, and and as I've watched the Sopranos, and I, I hear more and more stories about Tony Erso, I he he doesn't remind you. Does he kind of remind you of Paulie Walnuts a bit? Like just like he's a single guy, he's pretty good with women. You know, all he cares about is how he looks. He you know he kind of reminds me a bit of him a bit, but twenty times funnier. Yeah. I mean, it's just just his actions and sometimes things that come out of his mouth. What got him jammed up, he wanted to kill the rat's sons. He passed the comment, yeah. we should kill the rats, the guys who ratted their son. Mm -hmm. he, yep. Tony never even meant that. It was just out of jest. You know, sometimes you say stupid things. That was Blown off steam, right. And it's sad that he got to, he had to do, he wound up getting jammed up for that. It was just, a, we should, like, he just, Something stupid. I guess I have frustration. I have all the disappointment because he knew these guys, mm -hmm. you know. And then who who got stuck with the guys? Me. They were in my crew. So now when I had to meet them, everything was very gingerly, because you know I have to assure them, guys, nothing's going to happen to you guys. And you know, I give you my word, you don't have to come in. Like I wanted them to feel comfortable, but you're still part of this family. If you have any problems, let me know. I'm here for you. We can meet in any public place you want. I'm not going to call you in the middle of the night. Just to let them know to assure that they're safe. But Tony Green just said that, out, I guess, out of anger, frustration, hurt. Yeah. That still so many people cooperated. It makes sense. I mean, he had been around the life forever. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't. He didn't have a – he wasn't that type of guy. He wasn't like a, uh, a gas pipe. I will say, uh, you know, he'd never do it. Um, there are very few people I'd, I'd like to interview more than, than him. I, I would love right. to speak to him. I'm sure he has some fascinating stories. Oh, He's probably a, a trip. That, oh, he is. He is. And you'll, we'll talk about it later on on another show with you. Well, if he's ever, if he ever sees this, Tony, give me a call. <laughs> I'll pay you a thousand dollars for a half hour. Uh, All right. I got a few more. Um, George from Canada. Did you ever meet him? No, never met him. Um, his demise came prior to me. Uh, his daughter uh, was dating Vinny's son, Vincent. So they had a relationship, but I never got to meet the father. I heard uh, wonderful things about him. Vinny, I know, was sick. Sick, sick, sick about him getting killed. Sick. Do you believe that had to do... George. Love George. There, there's always questions as to why he was killed. Several people believe it was because Joe Messina thought he was a power threat. Exactly. Yes. Some sir. people. So you don't believe the fact that it was because he called uh, Tony Graziano a junkie. Absolutely you know? not. Absolutely not. Is it a known fact that he was a junkie? People, you take terminologies wrong. He did coke. Okay. I re listen, 90% of the guys, you sit down with them. Hey, do you ever do? Oh, I never did coke. Meanwhile, they're coming out of the bathroom. Hey, you have white stuff on your nose. What do you mean? Like so you're saying that's a norm. We all listen. Like I said, ninety percent of the guys you have street, we're street guys. We're, yeah. we're not saints. We're not priests. Where everything's proper. We knock around guys. So come on, we're in the life, of course. So did he do coke? Absolutely. Was he a junkie? I wouldn't go that far. Uh, but it depends on everybody's terminology of a junkie. Yeah, I wouldn't characterize someone who does right. coke socially as a junkie. Right. A, a junkie is someone who shoots heroin who, in their arm. No, you know. not even shoots heroin. Who parties all the time, sells everything they own, can't get off the drugs. Yeah, someone who's in an alley who's selling people. themselves. Right, Correct. sure. Yeah, Correct. Absolutely. But no, he didn't get killed for that. Joe Messino feared anybody with power. That's why I said he's a chameleon. Like. He brought the family to higher levels, to a stat stature that was unheard of. He brought it out of basically the dark ages. And then he also destroyed it at the end of the day by putting all garbage in the administration. And then he put the whipped cream with the cherry on top by wearing a wire and ratting. Especially right. at his age. Like, really? Come on. Very you, destructive. You'll, you'll be a legend. Well, now you're a legend too, but in a different sense. But in everybody just did. 
does their things for their own reasons. So I'm not knocking it. Maybe I feel a little bitter because that brought me in with Vinny. But um, at the end of the day, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad he did. When I look back, I'm glad. Even though I have bitterness, I'm happy because it gave me a better life. I got two more people for you. Um, you mentioned in that book as well uh, that this guy, uh, Richard Cantarella, uh, <laughs> he did at one point he would wear Hugo Boss uh you know, jumpsuits, if you will. And you made a comment that at one point he said, see that? That's going to be me someday. No, not me someday. This is me. This oh, is yeah. Okay. Point that, like he's the boss. He's uh, another guy, comical. Just um, him and his son. I mean, two guys never should have been in the life. Big money earners. Big, big money earners. I'll give them that. But you just, just the brief meetings with him. With Vinny, you know, even I'm like, Vinny, I don't like this guy. He says, Bo, me neither. But, you know, we have to do what we have to do. You know, he's, he's a captain, the family, and it is what it is. But he's a fuck. Vinny even said he's a fucking jerk off. He's telling me, look, boss, boss. <laughs> he's the boss. Like, just a jerk off. At one point, an underling would supposedly complain about his level of violence, to which Cantarello would say, quote, this is the mafia. I don't care. Is that true? Uh, if you could rephrase that, you lost me with the question. He essentially said, you know, he, you know, people were mad about the violence he was committing. He said, this is the mafia. What do I care? You know, this is what I do, basically. Uh, I don't know really what he did. It was before my time, so I can't answer that. Um, you know, I, listen, did he kill somebody? I don't know. Probably so. It's like I said, it doesn't take a rocket science, scientist to pull a trigger. Any dummy could do it. Yep. Yeah. So myself mm -hmm. included. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's not hard. It's easy when you, you have a guy sitting in the car, you, you're sitting in the back, you pull the gun out, and you pop him in the head. It's simple. Or you walk them into a house where they don't know. Get into a gun battle in the street, then that's a gangster. Absolutely. You know I mean? when, bullets, when somebody pulls on you and you're running, diving, or somebody says they're getting a gun and you're going after them, that's a gangster. Absolutely. You know, that's setting somebody up. Setting that up. Anybody could do that. That's easy. Uh, one other one here. Um, Ace. Oh, man, you hurt me with that one. Why do you say that? That's my heart. I love him. That's Ace. That's you Ace. called him at one point Luca Brasi. That was my Luca Brasi. We had more laughs and fun together. Uh, just I tried when I came in to cooperate. I didn't want to testify on him. I asked the government, no, you have, Dom, worry about yourself. That's all I was told. Worry about yourself because there's the door. Um, he's a big boy. If he wants to come in, he know. I mean, he's a man's man. I love him. I, I feel for him and his family, his mother, his brother who is autistic. I'm just, uh, till this day, it breaks my heart with Ace. Knowing Ooh. if he had the opportunity, he'd probably try to take me out if he was ordered to. Sure. Um, but uh, I mean, we were close. We were very, very close. Real quick on him. So I've I've done videos on him. I've done videos on his counterparts. Um, he was from Queens, though. He was a, a Giannini kid. Um, correct, How, Ridgewood, right? Ridgewood, correct. Ridgewood. Yeah. How did you get affiliated with those guys? Did they just? They were just kind of. I know a lot of the, the Giannini crew is interesting because they were kind of a farm team, and some became informants. Some, you know, went to prison. Some became, you know, today they're 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 made guys. How did you get affiliated with him? Because his cousin or uh, Joe, the uh, Giuseppe Gambino was also around you guys. Yes, um, I think it was Ace Anthony Aiello, Joey Gambini, and I think Mike the Butcher. I don't know his last name. They met Bruno when they were in jail. Okay. And Bruno told Vinny and I, "I have some guys I want you to meet." Ace came in. Uh, we met them all in the restaurant, steakhouse in Manhattan. And then uh, after they left, I told them, I said, uh, Vinny and I, I like Ace. I like the way he conducted himself. And then uh, from there, Vinny said, get close with him. So I got close with him. I would call him. He'd come. I mean, there isn't anything him and I didn't do. I, I really, really... There's, there'll be a lot of podcasts with Ace and and funny ones too because we had as much 
damage we did out there is as much fun we also had out there. Absolutely. All right, before we uh, kind of promote your your content and, and get you out of here, I have one final question. I usually ask this to every person Uh-oh. that was involved with that life. So I'm going to ask you, um, do you miss that life? Do you ever miss that world? Like, do you, like, if you could see Vinny, what would you, what would you tell him? Like, do you miss those times? You know, cause it seems like, you know, all of the folks that I speak to that were connected, th- there's a, there's a sadness to them, to me. Um, and, and to you, it seems like you have it as well. You, you're kind of wrestling with the fact that you didn't really want to do what you did, but you had to do it because you knew in the end it was going to be the best decision for you and your family. Um, and who am I to judge you? But do, do you miss that world? It seems like you kind of do, and you, you have a sadness to you about it. Anybody who tells you they don't miss that life is lying, or they weren't doing well in the life. Mm-hmm. If you're doing well, how how could somebody say I miss the glitz, glamour, glory, the prestige? You have you're sitting in a restaurant, and I'll give you a quick story. I'm at a restaurant. There's about twelve of us, all couples. I have Ace Joey Gambini with me. Uh, I think even Randy Pizzola was there. So I have a powerhouse crew with me that capable of a lot of violence. We could turn over a place real quick. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I asked the waiter for something. And I'm, listen, I'm more than, I love waiters. Nowadays, they call them servers. I'll always take care of them, especially if they give us the service. Even my wife tells me sometimes, you're too generous. I'm like, no, I feel for them. You know, some of them are going to college, whatever the case may be. We're sitting there. I asked him for something, and the guy got nasty with me. Like, he might have been having a bad day. So I said, pal, watch, you know, watch your mouth. There's women here, and watch your tone. He said something under his breath, but as he's walking away, he had some silverware in his hands, and it hit the floor. When I tell you, everybody jumped up and basically got around me, surrounded me, my guys. And the women at the table, oh, my God, what is he, the fucking president? The way you're protecting them. Because they thought, like, the guy was coming at me. They didn't know. You just heard a loud bang behind me. They Mm -hmm. all jumped up. We were laughing over that when one of the women said, what is he, the fucking president? So, yes, to have that type of lifestyle when you're sitting in a place and everybody knows if if myself, Vinny's the boss, was sitting there. If Ace walked into the place, and I was closer with Ace than Vinny was. Ace walks in, he shakes Vinny's hand first. He greets Vinny first. That's the boss. And then me. So when I'm out, everybody's coming directly to me. So no matter whether it's, say, Jeff, it's you and you're with your wife. You're, you're with me. Or, no, you're with your best friend. Your best friend's with me. You come into the place, you're going to shake my hand first. So it just shows the prestige in the life, the respect. And then also we have, I'll give an example, Mr. Chow's is a place in the city. I don't know if it's still there. I think 57th and 1st, if I'm correct, or 59th and 1st. I'd walk in there and not even make reservations. Walk in. And over there, in the beginning... I'm giving them $100, sitting at the bar, and you still have to, you make a reservation, you're still waiting a half hour, an hour. I'd walk in without reservations, they're making tables for me, and I'd sit down, just like you saw in the movie uh, Goodfellas. Goodfellas, yeah. Yeah. You're so, living your life like a schnook now. That's what you, you're living. But you know what? The schnook is happy. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's, I think that's the, I think that's the best part of Goodfellas in the end, because oh, Henry yeah. Hill talks about it, how, you know, he misses all the action, his life's just boring now, and it seems like in a way, you know, you've kind of made it, you know, kind of fun for yourself. In I a way. Just make of it. It's not, yeah. you know, well, he was, he made it portrayed like he was in uh bum fuck wherever. Iowa somewhere or something. Yeah. You know, I'm just living my life. Um, listen, I'd be lying if I said I fear or I'd be afraid. Everybody fears and everybody's afraid. If you, if you a person doesn't say that, then they they're really mentally something. But see, bad. Dom, the thing with you though is that that I find fascinating is all these guys on YouTube, right? Sammy, Mikey Scar, like all these guys. For the most part, the people they dealt with are dead, right? They're not around. Pretty much everyone you dealt with is a either in prison or getting out of prison soon, 
or on the street. Like Ace is getting out soon. You know, guys right. like that. Do you ever worry for your life at all? Um, I'm always cautious. I always worry. I always look. When my fight, wife first met me, she's like, why do you look at everybody? Why are you looking in every car that passes? Yeah, it's just, just human yeah. nature. You did it on the street and even more so now. But everybody also knows I'm not a slouch. And if you come, you miss. There's, you know. Yeah, you're mad in the end. Go there. And I'm not saying I'm, I live with fear every day, but I don't let it overpower me. I'm still a man. I still, I'm not even still. I'm living a righteous life now. So I look to avoid everything. And I just, um, to answer your question, I believe when the guy upstairs tells you your life is over or that last day, that last chapter in your life is finally going to end, doesn't matter. I could be taking a bath, have a heart attack. So many people I, I seen pass away like that. So it's just, and before they come after me, they better clean house in New York with all the cooperation. Yeah, the problems area. they have, right. So, and nowadays you can't get, how are you going to get away with it? The surveillance cameras all over the place. Mm -hmm. you know, very you go from the street light coming to anybody's house or location, you're on camera. So you're doomed to go to jail. If you want to go back to the rest of your life, I'll be dead. No problem. But you'll be doing the rest of your life in jail. I think the truth is, Dom, as we wrap this up, I mean, guys like this, I mean, it's, you know, as funny as the picture is, he's a guy that is really not around anymore in that world, right? No, I mean, because he doesn't want to die in jail. Right. And, and he also just, they're just, they're just gone now. You know, yeah. these new guys are the ones that are kind of in control. But, uh, Dom, we talk a little bit about what you're up to now. Uh, you just started a YouTube channel. It's called Mafia Roundtable. You kind of came out of nowhere, right? We saw, Scarpo read an article about you, about some of the work you did um, in, in Africa, which is very cool. Um, but now you're talking about your life on, on YouTube. What can we expect from it? Um, I'm going to put a link. if And I, I promoted it last week. I think it was two weeks yeah, ago. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you for you that. You got it. And, and I urge anyone, if you're not subscribed, in the description of the video, go, go click on it and go subscribe. I think, like I said, we're going to learn some, obviously, a lot of good stories. But this is such a, a view that we really haven't seen. I mean, we've heard... How many times have we heard the same John Gotti stories, you know, or, 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 or Vinny Giganti, you know, the, the Bonanos are a group that we haven't heard a whole, whole lot about as far as at least from the Bronx. So what are you going to do on the channel? What, what are your plans? Well, listen, I had a lot of interactions also with all the other crime families too, from Lucchese to Gambino's to Colombo. So um, stay tuned. There's a lot that's going to come out that's never been heard before. I'm always going to keep everything straight. I answer everybody's questions when they send it in. That um, I like it. I want to feel the pulse of the audience out there, accommodate. And being I've been doing that, I'm changing up my format. So I want to accommodate the listeners um, to go out there and also tell a story. Uh, I also love rap music. And like I said, I'm having fun. If some, I don't claim to be a rapper, people tell me, Dom, what are you doing? You're a serious guy. Yeah, I'm serious, but I'm having fun. So if somebody's having a bad day, they say, let me see what this idiot Dominic Sakali just did. And they hit on the rap, but they're miserable. They're pissed. They had an argument with their wife. They hear it and they start laughing. I did my job. I did my job. It's a joke. I'm having fun. And if it goes somewhere, it goes somewhere. If not, so be it. I'm just being me. And I want to clarify something because I made a statement in one of my videos about people, mobsters dancing at weddings. And everybody takes, I guess I'm starting to learn, I'm new to this and I apologize. But everybody takes it as, I meant dancing with your wife, a slow dance, nice. No, you're allowed to do that. Not getting up and doing the Macarena and all that if you're a made guy, looking re like, the way the mafia looks at that, that's ridiculous. But it's not ridiculous. They're having fun. But dances like that, when I said the mafia doesn't like people dancing, dancing the Macarena or whatever other trains they do at weddings, dancing like that. But you're allowed to dance with your wife, a slow dance, and, you know, respectfully. Gotcha. Not have a few drinks and then all of a sudden... <laughs> you're, you're doing some crazy stuff. stuff right okay but i want to be me i want the people to see me for who i am 
now I'm not governed by the mafia anymore, so I could do whatever I want to do. Dom, is it true? Uh, and I promise this is the last question, but no, go ahead. I'm okay. I'm, I'm really curious about this because you mentioned dancing at weddings, which you know is something we don't hear much about as far as like crazy funny dancing. And and I believe this was in that book that you and Scarpa wrote. Is it actually true that? And I can't believe I'm going to ask this, yeah. but is it actually true that you know cunnilingus eating pussy is taboo in that world? Oh, they say that. Yes. But listen, is that actually because we we saw in Sopranos and stuff? Is is that actually valid? The ones, of course, you can't listen. All right, I'll give you another one. I mean, it, I'm not going to mention his name because he's really a, a, just a, another idiot. I'm not even going to call him a buffoon. He's an idiot. Bruno's nephew was supposed to be another one. We're straight now. We're sitting down. We're we're with him. We're sitting down. His name's Alley Boy. Right there. I'm pretty sure it's Alley Boy. We're sitting down at a table. We're in the restaurant. Vinny's hitting him with 99 questions. <laughs> Finally, I don't know if it was the liquor talking. He turns around and tells Vinny, Vinny, Bruno, myself, all right, guys, I'm going to go home now and eat my wife's pussy. I went, oh. Vinny, like, I looked at Vinny. Bruno's like, turned his head. When he left, Bo, are you fucking kidding me? Like, you had to be there. Like, this guy's never getting straightened out. No, these are things you don't say. You don't talk about bedrooms. And the guys who advocate about that, you know, they want to make a point and point. They're probably the biggest lappers of, of us all. They're probably in there every night scuba diving down there. So it's. It's not supposed to be spoken about. So you're you're essentially saying that everyone does it. Come you on, just, really? Don't, don't speak That's about like it. Saying nobody does drugs in the mafia. Yeah. So yeah. Come on. Yeah. It's just more or less not talking about it and being a buffoon you're not about, supposed it. To talk about the sexual. No, it's different. You know, guys want to talk about. Oh, I effed the shit out of her. I had a doggy style. It's different. Um, gotcha. But yeah, it's like a taboo thing to talk about. But every come on, everybody does it. The guys that advocate, oh, I never did, I never did. They're the first ones that do it. Like they, that's what they're, they're known for. So. <laughs> well, I had to ask. No, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Tom Sakali, good to see you. Uh, thank you for coming on. I, uh, I, I've been wanting to kind of speak to you, and I'm, I'm. Thank you for for kind of uh, being so open with us. It means a lot. Um, I'm sure we'll speak to you again. Um, and like I said, go check out Dom's uh, YouTube channel. I really think it's going to be a, a fascinating look into the. Bonanno families, other families as well. Um, thank you for coming on, Dom. I appreciate it. Jeff, no, thank you. And really, 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 I appreciate the support when I first came out. I appreciate your honesty with things. And listen, I'm not going to speak for you, but from what I've seen, because I did my research before I came on to the show watching your videos, people do get things wrong. But when you're continuously baiting, putting labels or following through without doing any research, which I know you don't do. You you basically Listen, you're Dom, it's impossible for me to get every single yeah, point. Uh, but right. you have the bottom, you have the trolls out there, the bottom feeders. It's just it's disgusting. Like do some research. You call yourself intelligent, you call me a buffoon, but I'm here being honest. I'm being straightforward. There's always three sides to a story, I was told. Yours, <laughs> mine, and in the middle you'll find the truth. <laughs> so with that, um, Jeff, again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Looking forward to coming back on your show, especially after I come out with new stuff that's never been heard before. I know your listeners are going to definitely, definitely have a ton of questions, and I'll it would be my pleasure coming on your show answering. Well, I think next time maybe we'll do it in person. Maybe I'll come down to wherever you are. and, and well, we'll I could come to you. Um, we, could, we could figure it out. I'm, uh, I don't know. And definitely. I appreciate it. Well, like I said, everybody, go check out the the, the channel. I think you guys are really going to like it. And uh, yeah, it's good stuff. So thanks, Tom, for coming on. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Thank you, Jeff. Have a wonderful evening. And as always, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.